Hello everyone, welcome back to Biomedical Ethics. Today we're going to be continuing on in our second unit looking at the principles of biomedical ethics, though now we're going to turn our attention to, well, how exactly is this done? Um, what are some of the practical and theoretical considerations in medical practice? And what are the goals that medicine seeks to accomplish? All of these things are going to be related to, well, how we should organize and carry out medical care. I'm going to start by giving a recap of what we've looked at so far, and then we're going to discuss Chapter 5 of Medical Ethics and Humanities, the first half of it. So, so far, we've been looking at the ethical theories that undergird biomedical ethics, and we've also looked at the four principles that modern medical practice is based on. In other words, autonomy, non-maleficence, beneficence, and justice. This chapter is mostly focused on answering the two following questions. What is the scope of a healthcare professional's duty? And what does the profession of medicine look like? What does it mean to say that medicine is a profession? And what kinds of limitations uh, does that place on healthcare professionals? How should healthcare professionals act within this field? I'm going to be throwing a lot of information at you in this lecture. Um, don't be afraid to listen to it a few times to take it all in. I'm not going to be asking you to agree with everything that the authors say here. What I think that they're trying to make us aware of are the real practical limitations in practicing medicine and the different considerations that we ought to be aware of when it comes to caring for patients in clinical settings. Generally then, within the practice of medicine, we should try to get straight on how healthcare professionals should behave and what they ought to do in clinical settings and what the practice of medicine seeks to accomplish. So in some sense, we're kind of taking a meta view of what exactly are we doing in medicine? What are we trying to do? And then what are the real life considerations that healthcare professionals ought to think about throughout their practice. The authors start this chapter by talking about medical futility, and they use this to try to explain what the scope of a healthcare professional's duty is. While it is important to base medical practice on the ethical theories and principles that we've been looking at, and we all agree that this places certain duties on healthcare professionals, the authors are trying to argue in this chapter that the duties of healthcare professionals only extend so far. And that is due to a bunch of different things. In practice, and I know you probably all feel this way and have had personal experiences with this, it can be easy for healthcare professionals to overextend themselves to take on too much work, to feel obligated to reach certain health outcomes for their patients, to stretch themselves thin. But what the authors of this chapter are trying to get across is that it's important for healthcare professionals to realize that their duties and practices ought to be guided by the goals of medicine, the means that we use in medicine, the different rules that we've looked at so far, the resources available to medical practitioners and the effectiveness of medicine and medical interventions. So what they're going to do is discuss these things through the lens of medical futility. In practice, healthcare professionals often run up against this challenge, this obstacle, because Families want to do all that they can for patients, but a lot of the things that families want done 
are not actually going to be effective or beneficial to patients in question. So to quote one sentence from this chapter, the authors say, interventions are said to be medically futile if they have no realistic chance of achieving the goals of medicine. One of the major themes that's going to be investigated in this chapter is that it's generally accepted that healthcare professionals are under no obligation to provide medically futile interventions. Some have even gone, gone so far to argue that healthcare professionals are obligated to resist demands for futile treatment. And this is for a number of reasons. There's only so much that we can do for patients. There are only so many resources that hospitals and clinics and care teams have and it's not clear that engaging in futile interventions actually does hospitals and clinical settings or patients any good. They describe that medical futility comes in three general types. Physiologic, qualitative, and quantitative. And we're going to go through each of these uh, one by one. Physiologic futility is describes acts that are futile in, quote, achieving their physiologic objective and thus acts which offer no physiologic benefit to the patient. So an example of this might be giving CPR to, and I know this is rough, uh, it's gruesome, a decapitated person. This kind of medical intervention is futile because no amount of CPR is going to bring a decapitated person back to life. Similarly, no amount of CPR is going to bring someone back to life whose body has entered rigor mortis. In documents and practice, psych physiologic futility is often described with the phrase medically futile because ineffective. What the authors are trying to get us to see is that the means of medicine only extend so far. Depending on a person's life and the events that they have gone through, there are a bunch of interventions that, well, are just not going to be effective for them. Thus, healthcare professionals aren't, any, aren't under an obligation to expend resources engaging in futile physiologic interventions. And oftentimes this is not seen as controversial because it doesn't contain a value judgment. There's simply nothing to be done in cases like this. And there are a lot of cases like this. Until technological advancement uh, gets to a certain point, there are just some unfortunate cases in which a disease or a malady has spread too much or somebody has undergone just a really traumatic event that cannot be fixed. We can distinguish physiologic futility from qualitative futility. When someone uses this phrase, they're describing an act that may be effective physiologically but is non-beneficial to the patient in question. For example, like giving a patient artificial feeding and hydration if they're in a permanent vegetative state, like the Terry Schiavo case. The basic idea is this. Some interventions are physiologically futile. They're not going to bring the patient back. There's nothing that can be done. But some are futile, not because they're not actually doing something to the body that is helpful, but because it's not beneficial to the patient in question. This kind of futile medical practice is a little bit more controversial because, well, what exactly do we mean by something being non-beneficial to a patient? It all comes back to, well, what are we trying to do in medical practice? What are our goals? And what should we prioritize in clinical settings? For example, something might be uh, physiologically futile, but if our goal 
isn't to preside over the health of the body, but is to preside over the health of the soul, some medical interventions might be beneficial in a spiritual way or a psychological way. So it's not always clear exactly what is beneficial to a patient because it's going to be based on what we think the goals of medicine are and how we define the word beneficial. In practice and in documentation, qualitative futility is often described with the phrase medically futile because non-beneficial. This kind of futility is sometimes controversial because it does implicitly contain a value judgment. For example, that a human life divorced from consciousness is not the proper object of medicine. In other words, in a lot of, in a lot of clinical settings, there's this general idea that, well, we shouldn't expend resources on merely keeping a patient alive if they're not there, if they're not really there to experience life or have a good quality of life. These are things that healthcare professionals constantly have in the back of their mind and that they're questioning when it comes to the practice of medicine. Generally, though, there is this idea that what it means to live a good uh, quality human life is that one is able to engage in intrinsically human activities, experience things, uh, question things, converse with others. So sometimes in clinical settings, you'll see that a certain medical in intervention is not done for a patient because it's not clear that they are there anymore or that the medical intervention is actually going to do something beneficial for them. The idea lying behind this that a life in permanent vegetative state is not one that is really worth living, which is something that can be quite controversial in these settings. We can distinguish physiologic futility and qualitative futility from quantitative futility, or what is sometimes described as probabilistic futility. And this is one that perhaps you've seen a lot in the clinical settings that you've worked in. Quantitative futility describes acts that are very unlikely to produce a desired physiologic effect or personal benefit. It's often described with the phrase medically futile because improbable. The general idea here being, look, there's a really small chance that a medical intervention might provide some benefit to the patient, but that chance is so low that there's not really a point in engaging in it. Or the probability is so low that medical intervention X, Y, or Z is actually going to help the patient in the ways that we care about. So we're not going to expend the resources to do that. This kind of futility uh, can be examined by looking at cases like the Wangley case, the Baby K case, and the Gilgan case. And I'm going to read through those right now and just comment on them a little bit. First, the Wangley case. Helga Wangley was an 86-year-old, ventilator-dependent woman in permanent vegetative state. In November 1990, her physicians informed the Wangley family that continued mechanical ventilation was non-beneficial to her as a person and that it should be discontinued. Mrs. Wangley's husband, an attorney, daughter and son rejected the idea of withdrawing ventilator support, insisting that Mrs. Wangley would not be better off dead than in permanent vegetative state, and that in any event, a miracle could occur. Although Mr. Wangley allegedly originally reported that his wife had never stated her preferences concerning life-sustaining treatment in PVS, he later insisted that his wife had consistently said that she wanted such treatment even in the face of such a condition. The hospital asked the court to appoint an independent conservator 
to decide whether the continued use of the ventilator was beneficial to her. In the event the conservator found its use non-beneficial, the hospital asked that a second hearing be held on the question of whether it was legally obliged to provide the respirator. On July 1st, 1991, the court appointed Mr. Wangley his wife's conservator, and noting that the hospital had not yet made any request for permission to stop the ventilator, declined to address the merits of the case. The hospital announced that it would not discontinue ventilator support. Three days later, Mrs. Wangley died of sepsis-induced multi-system organ failure. So, in this case, there are a bunch of things going on. One thing that complicates it is that Mrs. Wangley did not explicitly make known the, the kind of care that she would like in a situation like this. But the most important feature of the case that the authors want to hone in on here is that because she was in a permanent vegetative state and she was very old, perhaps nearing the end of her life, continued mechanical ventilation was non-beneficial to her as a person. The general idea being here, like, look, while this is keeping her alive, it's not clear that this is doing her much, if any, good. And so there was a discussion, there was a conflict over whether or not the hospital should take her off of that mechanical ventilation. I'm sure that many of you have seen or experienced cases like this. The next case that the authors describe is the one of baby K. And this one is a little bit more complicated. Let's talk about it. Baby K was a female anencephalic infant born in October 1992 in Virginia. Because of perinatal respiratory distress, she was intubated and mechanically ventilated. Baby K's mother, Mrs. H, was told that no treatment existed for anencephaly and that no therapeutic or palliative purpose was served by continued mechanical ventilation. Nevertheless, she refused to consent to a do not resuscitate order, a DNR. The treating physicians consulted the Institutional Ethics Committee, which concluded that ventilator support was futile and should be stopped after allowing Mrs. H a, quote, reasonable time, unquote. Mrs. H rejected the committee's recommendation, and rather than pursuing legal action, the hospital took advantage of a window of opportunity, a period during which Baby K was not ventilator dependent, to transfer Baby K to a nursing home in November 1992. Unfortunately, Baby K required readmission to the hospital in January, and again in March 1993. Because it was expected that she would continue to experience episodes of respiratory distress requiring admission, intubation, and mechanical ventilation, the hospital finally commenced legal action and a guardian was appointed to represent Baby K. The guardian agreed that ventilator support should be withheld from Baby K when she experienced respiratory distress. The hospital requested a declaratory judgment that the withholding of ventilator support would not be illegal. In July 1993, the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of Virginia held that under the federal anti-dumping law, quote, the hospital would be liable if Baby K arrived there in respiratory distress and the hospital failed to provide the mechanical ventilation necessary to stabilize her acute medical condition. EMTALA requires that Hospitals provide stabilizing treatment to any person who comes to an emergency department in an emergency medical condition, where emergency medical condition is defined as, quote, acute symptoms of sufficient severity, such that the absence of immediate medical attention could reasonably expected to result in serious impairment to bodily functions or serious dysfunction of any bodily organ or part. Mtala, the court wrote, Quote, does not admit of any futility exceptions, unquote. Interestingly, 
the district court seemed to adopt the definition of medical futility, equating it to physiologic futility, when it wrote, even if Mtala contained a futility exception, it would not apply here. The use of a mechanical ventilator to assist breathing is not futile in relieving the acute symptoms of respiratory difficulty, which is the emergency medical condition that must be treated under Mtala. So again, we have another difficult case. A case of a female infant that was born with this malady, who was intubated and mechanically ventilated. The question here, and one that is often invoked in cases like this, is what kind of quality of life are we offering this patient? Is this a life that would worth uh, be living? Is keeping patients who require this kind of support and intervention, is that something we are obligated to do as healthcare professionals? Well, it's generally accepted that such futile treatment does not fall within the scope of the moral and medicinal duties of HCPs. But let's look at just one more case. The Gilgan case. Catherine Gilgan was a 71-year-old woman with Parkinson disease, diabetes, and heart disease, and was one year status post cerebrovascular accident and a mastectomy for breast cancer. She was admitted to the Massachusetts General Hospital in June 1989 for surgery to repair a hip fracture, and while there developed extensive and irreversible brain damage secondary to status epilepticus, resulting in a coma. The patient's daughter, Joan, who was the surrogate, informed the physicians that Catherine always said she, quote, wanted everything done, unquote, that was medically possible. With the encouragement of the hospital's optimum care committee, Mrs. Gilgan's attending physician wrote a DNR order on July 5th, despite these expressed wishes. Dr. Ned Cassum, the chair of that committee and acting as the consultant, took the view that the family's option or opinion, sorry, was not relevant since CPR was not a genuine therapeutic option. The social worker's notes concurred that the family's inability to prepare for the inevitable did not justify mistreating the patient. Because of his inability to argue strongly on medical grounds against Joan and her family's beliefs, the doctor revoked the DNR order two days later. The following month, a new attending physician, Dr. William Deck, took over the case. The new attending physician couldn't convince Joan of the inappropriateness of CPR for her mother. Dr. Dr. Deck asked the OCC to review the case again. Dr. Kassem, still acting as a consultant on behalf of the committee, once again endorsed a DNR order because CPR would be, quote, medically contraindicated, inhumane, and unethical, unquote. Dr. Deck, with the approval of the MGH Legal Counsel, wrote the DNR order. He also began to wean Catherine from the ventilator, since he regarded her as imminently dying. Her blood gases were not monitored during the weaning, because Dr. Deck did not expect her to survive on her own. Three days later, on August 10, 1989, Catherine Gilgan died. Joan Gilgan sued the hospital and the physicians for intentional infliction of emotional distress. In a jury trial before the Suffolk County Superior Court, the hospital and physicians were found not guilty of negligently imposing emotional distress on the patient's daughter. The judge had asked the jury to consider whether the patient, had she been able to, would have requested CPR and continued mechanical ventilation. The jury answered yes to both questions, but agreed with the defendants that such treatment would have been futile. So, what is being investigated in these cases is how far the scope of duty extends within these settings. What exactly are healthcare professionals obligated to do? Well, generally it is accepted, it's argued, that 
while healthcare professionals have certain duties in the practice of medicine, it is generally argued that carrying out futile interventions is not one of them. Again, we need to connect this to the goals of medicine. This is something that we'll talk about in the next lecture, but insofar as we think the practice of medicine is supposed to do certain things, that is going to influence our decisions regarding futile interventions, the expending of resources, etc. So now let's kind of go into that a little bit. The second half of this lecture, I now like to talk about the goals and means of medicine. The authors note that medical practice has four general go goals which are clearly outlined in the Hastings Center's Goals of Medicine project. These are, first, the prevention of disease and injury and the promotion and maintenance of health. Second, the relief of pain and suffering caused by maladies. Third, the care and cure of those with a malady and care of those who cannot be cured. And fourth, the avoidance of premature death, and the pursuit of a peaceful death. Thus, the goals of medicine generally are to prevent disease and injury, maintain health, relieve pain and suffering, providing care, cure those who can be cured, and avoiding premature death, and hopefully securing a good or peaceful death for those who are terminable. While these are the general goals of medicine, one of the things that come up in discussions of medical futility and how healthcare professionals should actually act within clinical settings are the means that medicine employs to reach these goals. Thus, it has been argued that only certain means may be employed in advancing the goals of medicine. It is not a free-for-all. There are rules in these different settings as to how physicians and care teams actually advance and meet these goals. Certain moral, legal, and ethical goals uh, means must be employed. I will summarize them as follows. First, physicians must be competent and employ competence when they're actually treating patients. Second, physicians must honestly portray medical knowledge and skill to patients and to the general pu public, avoiding any sort of fraud or misrepresentation. Third, Physicians must avoid harming the patient in any way that is out of proportion to the expected benefit, and they must seek to minimize the indignity and the invasion of privacy involved in medical examinations and procedures. Finally, physicians must maintain fidelity to the interests of the individual patient. So let me try to summarize those in a little bit more accessible language. When we're trying to meet the goals of medicine, which are basically preventing disease and injury, relieving pain and suffering, caring for people and curing those who can be cured, and preventing premature death, and making sure that a patient meets a good death, there are only certain means or certain rules that can be followed. Doctors, physicians can't just do whatever they want. Care teams can't just do whatever they want. They have to exhibit a certain level of medical knowledge and skill. So physicians must basically know what they're doing. And then when they're treating a patient, do that well. You know, not intentionally mess up. And in some cases, we might even talk about negligence. Physicians must have the 
medical knowledge to carry out these interventions. They must be skillful enough to do this. And they must try to avoid misleading a patient, uh, engaging in fraud, misrepresenting any interventions. So here we see the principles of biomedical ethics popping up again, right? Insofar as respect for patient autonomy requires accurately portraying possible interventions to patients. And it's also involved in this third requirement Physicians must minimize the indignity and invasion of privacy for patients. So this is a big thing in medical ethics. Oftentimes when we're talking about giving a patient a good or peaceful death, we want to safeguard the dignity of the person. We also want to, you know, not spread their information willy-nilly, but respect their privacy. And physicians must take care to basically not promote any unnecessary harm. If they do harm the patient, it has to be in a way that is proportional to what the expected benefit is. Finally, physicians ought to do what they do for the best interest of the patient. And they must be committed to this. We don't let doctors randomly experiment on people or do whatever they want. Within the practice of medicine, if our goal is to care for patients, then that's what we have to try to do. Not disregard their wishes and desires and do whatever we want to them. I know that this is you know, common sense, but it's worth noting and, and getting it explicitly out there. In other words... Healthcare professionals must possess the relevant medical knowledge, use it appropriately and honestly, possess the relevant skills, and utilize them with care and effort. These are the acceptable means that healthcare professionals may employ to advance the goals of medicine. Thus, to summarize, Within the practice of medicine, there are a bunch of factors that are, that are important that should guide medical decision-making and care and healthcare interventions. We need to make sure that healthcare pra professionals have the proper intentions when they're caring for patients. We need to consider whether an intervention is going to advance legitimate medical goals this is where the question of medical futility comes in, right? If an intervention is not advancing any medical goal, are we going to do it? Well, normally not. Third, we need to interrogate the means being used. Healthcare professionals, doctors, physicians, care teams need to follow certain rules when they're caring for patients. Right? We don't just let them do whatever they want, whenever they want. We need to consider how those means are employed. And another consideration is what kind of resources are going to be expended in the care of a patient. A harsh truth about the practice of medicine is that we live on a finite earth with finite resources, with care teams that only have finite energy and resources and care that they can provide to patients. Unfortunately, a lot of times these different clinical settings are stretched. There are issues with understaffing. During the COVID pandemic, we saw issues with lack of ventilators, right? So lack of resources generally. All of these things are related to the practice of medicine. And so when we're talking about how we should organize these different settings, these are all considerations that need to come into play and considerations that 
we need to look at if we're honestly and actively trying to do what's best for our patients and advance legitimate medical goals. That basically covers what I wanted to look at in the first half of this chapter. To summarize, what we looked at is medical futility. It's generally accepted within medical practice that the duties of healthcare professionals only extend so far, and healthcare professionals don't have an obligation to provide medically futile interventions. We broke down the three different types of medical futility. We looked at a few cases, and then we looked at the goals and means of medicine. All of this is going to be related to what we look at next lecture. If you have any concerns or questions, don't hesitate to email me. Otherwise, I hope you found this information useful and interesting, and I will see you all next time. Okay, bye-bye.